Many of you have followed Frances during her impressive journey over the years. She was self-taught and has risen to the top of her profession, having sculpted over a hundred famous faces from members of our royal family to leading figures in the arts, politics and sport. I was, you know, always, always drawing and sketching all my life and that was a big part of it. My mum used to teach me how to sketch and the whole of my life was very artistic. My dad was very artistic and uh, really there's not much you can do without art. I was born in Leeds in Yorkshire, an only child, our very artistic parents. My dad was a composer, my mum was an artist, and I lived in this lovely, very, very safe, cosy atmosphere of grandmas and grandpas across the road. We went away quite a lot, my mum and dad and I, and we would go to Italy and Venice. I always painted, I always sketched wherever I went and art was a very big thing in my life and that was my favourite subject at school. The rest of the subjects I slept through but I think that as I got older had, and I had my children I then took it up properly and I then I realised how it's just taken over my life. I was obsessed with it and the obsession was with sculpture. I never stopped once I started and pain, I went through lots of pain doing it. My mum decided to let me go to a course on deportment at a model agency in Leeds when I was 14 because I felt very unconfident. She thought it would help me and they immediately wanted me to do um, modelling at shows and I then became a model and I did all the fashion shows. I was in the newspaper every week. I did shows everywhere, photography. Um, it was amazing. I loved it. So at that point I'd really sort of done my modelling. I was 18 and moved to London, had my two children by then. And then when they were young, I started to learn about sculpture. The first sculpture was after I'd been teaching in a class um, in a church art centre in Whetstone. I'd been nagged by the vicar to teach and I said, no, 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 I can't teach. I'm not the teacher. And he said, yes, you can. You'd be wonderful. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I had masses of classes and loads of people. And then we had an exhibition for all the artists to put their stuff in. And the vicar said he'd sit. And I said, no, I can't do that because I've never sculpted anyone in front of anybody, you know. And he said, well, just have a go and he got his face in the paper and we had masses of people there. And then uh, two hours I'd finished it. I couldn't believe it. So it was like magic, you know. And I absolutely thought, there's no way I'll ever do this again in my life. I started teaching and I really enjoyed it, but it took up so much time. You know, I was, had about five classes a week and wasn't able to do much of my own work really didn't probably was a bit tired and I was loving doing all the exhibitions because I love being with lots of people then you know from there as I was getting more and more important people to sit at these two-hour sessions I was asked to do more work 
And then I thought, you know, I've got to stop that, start doing my own work now, and that's how it happened. I had a phone call from my stepfather, because my mother remarried later on in life, and he said, oh, Francis, Billy Bremner's has passed away and Leeds United want a sculpture of him. You must, you, must put, you must write in. And I said, no, 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 Ronnie, I'm not doing that. You know, I've never done a large sculpture before. I can't do that. He said, oh, please, love. You know, like the real <laughs> Leeds accent. And then in the end, I just thought, oh, I'll just write in anyway to please him. Never dreaming for a minute I would get it. It was really stressful, but it was an exciting stress because I didn't know what I was letting myself in for because I'd never done one. And I was very determined to do it all myself. And I think it just took a year out of my life, really. I mean, you know, I just used to use clay. I mean, there's much easier ways of doing them so you don't have to wet them all the time. But I just wanted to do it the way I knew. And I used to have to wrap this thing up every day with, you know, plastic, make sure everything was, you know, absolutely airtight. I was asked to go back to Leeds United to actually decide where this was going to go and I chose right in front of the stadium, you know, and it was marvellous that they let me do that. It seemed to shape my future because it became a, a, a vocal point in Leeds, all the footballing crowd are there, they put all their stuff on it. While I was sculpting Billy upstairs in the bedroom here, I had a phone call to say, you know, that I had got the sculpture for, to do with the Duke of Edinburgh. They'd already had my portfolio beforehand, and because he'd been a patron of London Youth for 50 years, so they wanted a bust to commemorate that. You cannot explain how nerve-wracking it is going to the palace, and I had to go to the palace to see the room first and to know how to carry on, um, you know, the word is uh, the etiquette, isn't it? And, you know, the procedure with the Duke of Edinburgh. I had to learn how I stand up in the middle of the room when he's coming in and all the various things, which make you much more nervous. But, you know, I got to know him and I had four sittings with him. So he, I wasn't scared in the end, he was lovely. William Haig agreed to sit for children in need and we sculpted this in Mayfair. It was packed completely and utterly packed. He was quite important at the time. He had this very unusual forehead, which I thought, oh God, I'm not going to do this. But I actually managed. And there were TV cameras, there was radio, there was everything, you know. And it was a very exciting event. I went on television, I sculpted Lorraine Kelly, and that was done while she was doing her programme. And then there was Gloria Hunniford's programme on TV in 2001. I was invited to go on the programme. While she was presenting, I would sculpt her, which is always very hard to do, you know, when they're actually talking. Jilly Cooper was one of the guests, and Jilly Cooper had brought the bust I sculpted of her that was on the programme, plus some other sculptures I'd done. So when I'd finished Gloria. Well, we walked around the sculptures and we looked at Jilly Cooper's sculpture and Jilly spoke about her experience of sitting with me, which was lovely. It was really good. Clive Anderson was great fun. I mean, he was amazing because he has got such a natural funny side. He's such a comedian and Herbert Smith sponsored the evening and when it was finished there was this marvellous question and answer session going on and it was absolutely hysterical you know because his answers were so amazing. When I actually finished Vinnie Jones he'd been doing filming for um, sort of a fly in the wall is it called thing on his life. So they came to Westminster Hall and they finished off there. This was before an event I was putting on myself for London Youth. I'd organised to get Bruce Forsyth there, Clive Anderson, Tony Banks, the late Tony Banks, and it was a very, very, very interesting thing to have all those people there. Ben Goran Eriksson was a most unusual sculpting session. I had been told to go to um, Football Association, and it was in Soho Square then. 
and I arrived with my headstand with my bit of clay on, clay bags and everything in a cab and I walked inside and the woman at the reception desk said, I told her I was there to sculpt Sven and she said, oh, have you not heard? He won't be here today. So I said, really? I said, why not? Oh, she said, have you not read the papers? So I said, no. So I didn't know what they were talking about. But then I found out that he had, it'd been in the papers that he'd had an affair with a woman and he was with Nancy Del Olio at the time. I thought, I'm just going to sit here for a while and see what happens, you know? And about half an hour went by and he walked in. Came up to me, as cool as a cucumber, and he got hold of my hand to kiss. And he said, I'm so sorry. Please, let's do another time. I remember John Perfumo very well, and he sat for me at Toynbee Hall. Despite all the scandals in his life, he was a really lovely, charming man. That sculpture was unveiled at Toynbee Hall by John Major. Then the Queen was 2009. I wrote to Bernardo's and I said, you know, I'd, like, I'd love to do the sculpture of the Queen. I've done Prince Philip and it would be, I think, very lovely that the same sculptor's done both. So they approached the palace. The Queen wrote back and she said that she thinks that would be okay, but not quite then, she was very busy. So we, I wrote back probably about six months later and I got it in the end. That was the most nerve wracking experience of my life, really nerve wracking. And I thought, you know, I've been there before, but it didn't make any difference because, you know, I would looked up to her all my life. This was the apex of my life to do the Queen, that was it. You know, she was sitting on a sort of heightened dais in the room and her nice chair was in the middle of that. So I actually found it really hard to reach to get the calipers to measure her. It was so surreal and my hands were shaking. <laughs> I had to go to Highgrove. It was so beautiful going there. I really loved it. Tech Guru was a little village. I stayed there right while I did it. I was nervous, obviously, but he was a very nice, caring person very sensitive man. The royal family are amazing because they're very disciplined, they sit very straight, they don't fidget, which I can't possibly do, and they don't seem to need any drinks of coffee or tea or anything. And they just sit so, so quietly, but not quietly, they're quite, their bodies are quiet, but they don't, they talk to me all the time. So I just have this privileged hour and I have to talk as well and I can't concentrate. I've had an insight into the royal family, which is a wonderful experience, you know, to actually sit with these people. And being a sculptor, you do get inside people's heads, you know, you can feel things. And they've named me the royal sculptor. I didn't put that name on me, but I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> Don't mind that. I was asked if I'd go on TV to Scott Day Medna at the one show and I was given some photographs and they said that she'd be coming on at a certain time. So I started to get the shape of the head ready and everything and then the table collapsed and the bus fell on the floor so that was that. Then I thought, oh, I'm not giving in, you know, I'm getting back, take it off the floor and start again. And then, um, so I was ready for when she came on, you know, and I had a little bit ready. And in between, I'd gone into the, um, the ladies to get my makeup put on and uh, there was this man walking in the hall in a very a very tall man in a, um, a very smart overcoat and it didn't strike me that it would be Dame Edna <laughs> so I never thought it would be and then I started sculpting really quickly when he was on it was just like a madness my sculpting and I can't believe how well it turned out Derek Jacobi I'd met him years prior to that event and we hadn't actually done anything about sculpting, but so he came back and he said he would sit and that was really lovely and it was to do with Islington Arts Factory. He is just a delight, that man, absolutely wonderful, you know, just felt like I've known him all my life and everybody adored him, the room was packed. He did a massive long question and answer session afterwards and, you know, it was fantastic. 
about four years ago, I decided that I really needed help with my work because there was lots going on, lots of interest, and I was really struggling to do all this on my own. So through a friend, they introduced me to Simon Tarrant, and I met him in a cafe opposite the Royal Academy. And as soon as I saw him, I knew that we were going to get on forever. And he's been amazing. We just get on so well. And we're like best friends and we, we really enjoy doing things together. I was struck by the, this very glamorous, vivacious lady uh, who actually is much, much more than that. She's a very talented artist. And she's, she's somebody who, who wants to, to give something back. My name's Alexander Stringer. Um, now an ex-serviceman, but I've served in 2-3 Pioneers for five and a bit years now. In January of 2011, I stepped on an IED, resulting in the loss of both legs and my left arm. Well, when I saw his photograph on the, on the cover of the Sunday Times supplement, and I just thought that I have to sculpt this man. Frances is known for celebrity sculpture. That's her thing, I suppose. And she's done very, very famous people, but she also is just interested in sculpting, you know, that ultimately that's what she wants to do. And if she, she meets someone that she thinks they have an interesting face or an interesting story, that, that, that's something that would attract her to sculpt them. I believe that uh, we have all got an obligation in life to give something back. She's always been ambitious, she's always wanted to get on and to be successful, um, but I think I've just helped her to structure it a bit better. And I do love her dearly. I think we're 24 years now uh, together. But, um, she's got a very good heart and uh, very sympathetic and understanding to people. I've never been able to want to do anything unless it's helping something, because it makes me feel good. I just feel it's so lovely if you're doing this, if you can help some other people at the same time. So I tried to do that from the very beginning, which I have. And um, each time I do an event for two hours, it's always for a charity. I like Frances' work very much. And I feel very flattered to have been asked to sit for her. Julian Fellows was wonderful. I chatted with him beforehand because I like to have half an hour, 20 minutes to speak to somebody so I can get to know how they put their head and how they are and, you know, and see what they feel like, you know, relax them a little bit. And he was just such a beautiful man. And I thought, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that forehead because when people have got hardly any hair, the foreheads, it's hard to get the shape, you know, because you really have to get the right shape. You've no hair to cover it. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have a real terrible time with that. But I did it. In 2016, we organised an event for the Stroke Association. And this was me taking a lot of my bus to the Tower of London to display for Heads at the Tower. Joanna Lumley was Oh, amazing, because we'd done all this work to get this room ready in the Tower of London, and it was precision, the lighting and everything was just unbelievable, you know, and it was just for this one night. It's nice to see them all together tonight. Normally they were scattered around the house, but uh, tonight they are under one room, and I think it looks marvellous. To be invited to come to the Tower of London, one of the exciting. To be sculpted by Francis Sigmund, stupendous. We were planning it for two years. We had hired the Tower of London and it was a very, very complicated venue because of where it was with the Crown Jewels. So there's rows and rows of these stands, all black, and all the bus on them. Simon and I just put these lights on and we couldn't believe what this room looked like. We had tears in our eyes. Lord and Lady Fellows were there and they were wonderful. They presented the evening. There was Elaine Page, there was Ainsley Harriet, um, there was the vicar that I first sculpted, he was there. It was packed, the atmosphere was amazing, Joanna was wonderful, it was sensational. Frances has consistently excelled herself because you see the work, the detail that, that goes into it, the instant recognition, I think that's what it is. You instantly look at something, oh, that's so and so, that's so and so.
I met Jack 25 years ago and I didn't know Wapping existed in those days. I'd never been to Wapping in my life because I come from Yorkshire. It is an unusual place, I love it, absolutely love it now, but it took me quite a while to get used to it. But this little square we're in, is, uh, we've got a little bit of community feeling here, which is really nice. And uh, my studio is overlooking the river, which is lovely. It's very good for my creative process because I'm in the middle of London and I go to the Tate Modern, the National Gallery, Royal Academy, everywhere, all the time. And I get my inspiration from the galleries and from everywhere I walk. My dad was a very introvert man in lots of ways and he played music all the time. He played the piano and the violin and composed music night and day. My great grandfather built this doll's house for my mum and her brother and they never appreciated it. So this beautiful doll's house had a garden, it had all the furniture carved out inside it, everything was so beautiful. But my mum used to just, you know, just used to rubbish it really, the cat used to live in it. And by the time I got it, which was years and years and years ago, I just took it wherever I went. It eventually came to the studio. And ever since it's been in the studio, it's been extremely special. Because I work and I think about my great grandfather and I think, you know, he must have been very artistic. She somehow has this ability to, in a very short period of time, it is quite concentrated, I must say. I can, I can always remember thinking, can I move my face? Can I become animated? Can I actually smile? I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, but it's two hours, which is very, very fast for a sculptor. Are we off? For me, if I could, I would do everything in front of people. I, would, I just love those sculpting sessions because I, I find it magical sculpting like that. I mean, it, I can't do it any other time. And the work is very quick, very loose, and I get the look of the person, and it's, it seems to be f just fantastic. So I, I've got something going on there when I'm, when I'm doing it very fast, which I don't have any other time. Eamon Holmes came here actually to do a program on my husband and myself. He said, you know, would I knock up a sculpture of him really quickly? So and that's how it came about. We put something together at the Film Museum and we had a wonderful evening for Geisha School, which is a charity for children with special needs. And he was very entertaining. And it was a really lovely evening. It, it was, they are special evenings. I'm encouraging young artists to put stuff in these events because how hard it was for me to, you know, to get out there and do things. Frances is so amazing. She's gonna donate her sculpture to the to the live auction, and that's to raise money for the project. And you know, she's incredible. She's very talented, and for any artist to work together, it's amazing. And an artist like her. She has a real talent. I don't know what talent is, but uh, you, you, when you see her sculpt sculptures, you see it has something special. I do goal setting each year. I set my goals out, which I find amazing when I read them back on them, you know, how many have come true. And I visualize, which is another visualization process, which I do with them. And I've done that for, from the beginning of sculpting. And I find it quite incredible how I've gone from being somebody that you know, I'm just learning, and then I managed to do the Queen. You know, that's just, it's really an amazing thing, isn't it? And self-taught. So it's good for people to know that you can do it if you're really determined. And it is just determination and hard work, really. And a little bit of a gift, but people can sculpt even without that, and they can enjoy it an awful lot. I went up to Leeds a while ago, and I sculpted a Holocaust survivor, Eric Hirsch, for the Macor Trust in Leeds. Being from, coming from Leeds, they asked me if I would do that. Very special to me, because I'm Jewish, and of course I was brought up after the war, but you know, I know so much about all these terrible, terrible things, and I was very, very nervous about doing it, because I thought there would be just so much emotion, and I wasn't sure how he would be, but this man, 
I met him beforehand. He was just delightful. That such a special man and no bitterness in him. I've had times when I've wanted to do nudes or I've wanted to do commissions for people, dogs or bodies or anything, you know, but um, it's just I get so many commissions to do busts that I'm just doing one, going from one to another, which really takes up a lot of time. And then I don't really have time to do the other things. But then I think I'm just somebody that does busts. And I think that that's great. You know, I'm learning about amazing characters. I'm getting an insight into their minds and they're telling me things that, you know, it's not because they're telling me these things that I think it's amazing, it's because I am learning about human beings, you know, and I can actually put that into the sculpture. Well, I've always studied faces, you know, and I stare at people probably, and that's really probably a little bit unnerving for people, but I study ears and necks and hair and all the time, you know, it's constant, it's a constant learning process. You know, this is an ongoing process for me. I am always thinking about who I can be doing and other people around me are doing that. So there's always the most exciting things that are happening and we're planning all the time and big events, which is, that is amazingly exciting world I'm living in. <laughs>